Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for our Tax Practitioner Board webinar. My name is Lun Lak, and I'm joining you from Karakul country. I respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, waters, and community. I would like to pay my respect to them and their cultures and elders past and present. To begin, I have a few quick housekeeping messages. First, to obtain a copy of today's slides, you can visit our webinar resource hub at tbb.gov.au slash webinar hub. We'll also email you a copy of the slides uh, following the, the session. Today's webinar counts towards your continuing professional education or CPE, and you can claim one hour for attending. In relation to claiming your CPE, we will um, issue an attendance certificate to those staying on for the duration of the session. Mm. In this webinar, we're gonna address the importance of ethics, ethical standards, the regulatory framework, recent law changes, proposed reforms, and how we are working, working collectively. We will also dedicate some time at the end of the webinar to respond to your questions. In that regard, we have Madeleine and Kristen from our policy and legislation team joining today. They will be responding to your, your questions as we go. To find the Q&A, simply move your mouse over the screen and a range of icons will appear. You can also use the chat function to speak to other participants, but we won't be monitoring uh, the chat closely throughout the presentation. So if you do have a question and need a response from us, uh, make sure to use the Q&A. Uh, so our speaker for today is TBB Chair, Peter Dikua. Peter, I'll hand over you to start the presentation. Uh, thanks, Lon, and uh, welcome to everybody and thanks for joining us today. Um, for your information, I'm being supervised today by uh, Matilda, the golden Labrador, who's asleep on the couch behind me. So if she wakes up and, and has a bark, don't, don't worry about it too much. She won't take much time. Um, as as Lon has said, just setting the scene, we're, we're here to talk today really about the importance of ethics and running an ethical pro professional practice. I'm sure everybody is, is aware that there have been a number of recent events and a fair bit of... Um, scrutiny of our profession, in particular in relation to integrity and standards. Now, I really do want to emphasise that the vast majority of practitioners are either doing the right thing or doing their best to do the right thing. So today, really, we, we're going to go through what's happening in terms of the requirements for professional and ethical behaviour, what law changes and law reform is coming in, uh, just to try and put a practical bend and make your life as a practitioner easier and make sure that you're able to continue um, to provide the services that are so valuable to your clients uh, without breaching any of those ethical or professional standards. Many of you uh, in your own practices are reviewing and rebuilding your capability to reinforce ethics uh, and to reinforce through training and development of your own staff, and we genuinely support that. We commend these improvements and we're pleased to see the professional associations working very closely with us to support the regulatory framework with guidance, complaint resolution uh, and effective disciplinary procedures to support professional conduct. Your own transparency and cooperation can assist us in mitigating any matters that are impacting on your own registration. In addition, we very much welcome the government reforms which will enhance our regulatory framework and give us the opportunity to work collaboratively with you, uh, our co-regulators, the professional bodies uh, and the community at large. Now that I've set the scene, I'd like to take a look at what we mean when we talk about ethics. So how do you define ethics? Uh, let us know what you consider ethics are through the poll. Over to you, Julie. Thanks, Peter, and good afternoon to everyone who's joined us today. So as Peter said, we're just going to conduct a quick poll. So the question we're asking is, what is ethics? And we've got a few options for you to choose from there. So the first one is behavioural standards. Second, we've got concepts of right and wrong. Third is moral principles. And four is a combination of all of the above. So I'll just launch that for you. And I'll give you a couple of seconds to put through your responses. And then once we've got those responses, we'll come back and we'll share the results and we'll get Peter to explain um, what ethics are.
Okay, we've got about 60% so far, so I'll keep it open for a little bit longer to give you a chance to put through your response. It's a nice quick one. Okay, I'm just going to close that poll now and I will share those results so they'll pop up on your screen. So Peter, it looks like we've got about 96% of people think that it's a combination of all of the above. 3% are saying that it's behavioural standards. 2% have said concepts of right and wrong and the other 2% have said moral principles. So I'll hand back to you so you can uh, take us through what the correct response is. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Julian. It's another really good example um, that most of the time the people that attend these seminars are the ones that need it the least. So. Um, it looks to me like you're all pretty much on, on top of the right answer there. Um, it's really fair to say that ethics is encompassing all of the above. Um, I'm sure you all know that, that the word has its origins in the Greek language and really uh, the word ethos means character in Greek. The Macquarie Dictionary gives a modern definition as a system of moral principles by which human actions and proposals may be judged good or bad, right or wrong. Um, and although there, there's a clear link between ethics and morality, there is a difference. Really, you know, morals are the way we govern our own personal conduct and they they um, work from our own belief, values and principles uh, and our own perceptions of right and wrong. Therefore, morals can be, you know, they differ from person to person and they differ based on people's own paradigms. Uh, their own values and their own community or cultures. Ethics, on the other hand, are really a framework of standards or rules that we can use to govern our conduct in particular settings and by which other people can freely uh, judge or hold to account our own behaviour. Generally, these standards are often set down in, by professional bodies uh, in their regulatory codes or by practitioner registration requirements or they can be established and judged by the wider community. Um, you may define ethics as professional, you know, professional conduct as standards or principles set by agencies or professional organisations to define the conduct of the people associated with that organisation or profession. Now that we've defined ethical conduct in a, in a professional context, let's talk about why it's important um, in what we do day to day. Every profession requires a set of rules that govern the appropriate conduct for the profession. Professionals such as accountants, lawyers and doctors, we're all in a privileged position of trust in the eyes of the general community. And generally that privilege comes about as a result of our educational standards or our uh, access to information, access to other professionals. So we're seen as, as leaders in the community. With that privileged position comes an obligation and responsibility to ensure that we provide services in a way that uh, justify that trust. We need to apply a sense of fairness and professional judgment in all of the things we do. As professionals, we also have a, a responsibility to serve the public interest as well as our own interests and the, and the interests of our clients. And we should be aiming to build and enhance the community's confidence in our own profession. We really simply must act ethically and responsibly in a way that's consistent with the reasonable expectations of the broader community. The ethical standards define the behaviours that serve the interest of the community and help build the confidence and trust of those who rely on our professional services. If we now jump into talking about our regulatory framework and the standards that are expected specifically of tax practitioners who are registered with the TPB. As you're well aware, the TPB is responsible for the registration and regulation of tax practitioners. This includes tax and BAS agents under the Tax, a tax Agent Services Act of 2009, or the TASA for short. As practitioners provide tax agent and BAS agent services to the Australian community, the TPB has a role to play in protecting consumers of tax practitioner services. TPB must ensure that the community has trust and confidence in the tax profession and in particular in the integrity of the tax system. To build and maintain this trust, uh, we must ensure that tax practitioners provide their services to the public in accordance with appropriate standards of professional and ethical conduct. 
these standards are laid out in the Code of Professional Conduct, which is in the TASA. I will refer, and I will refer to it today. Uh, it was created to assist the TBB in achieving the consumer protection obligations that we have. The code is legislated and is set is a set of ethical and professional standards providing a framework for expected practitioner behaviour. And really, our code is like the code of many other professions. It's based on the general principles of ethical professional behaviour. The TPB standards framework comprises of a fit and proper person test, a code of professional conduct obligation, um, civil penalty obligations, uh, a set of sanctions that are available to the TPB where practitioners have done the wrong thing, and also a fitness and propriety test, which we'll talk about in some detail later today. Or, oh, in fact, right now. Um, to be a registered tax practitioner, you are obligated to be and to continue to be a fit and proper person. To understand the concept of fitness and propriety, propriety for tax practitioners, we need to first understand what is expected professional conduct is. The term professional conduct, we mean the way in which you act professionally uh, in your day-to-day -day working capacity. You play an important role in providing services to the community, which include a wide range of clients in varied businesses, professions, and in their individual and private capacities. Many of your clients have limited or, in fact, sometimes no real knowledge of our tax system, so it's an important task that demands great attributes of competence, good fame, integrity and character of our registered practitioners. So your conduct as a practitioner should be such that the TPB, the ATO and the public at large can have trust and confidence that you perform your role competently and with integrity. When providing services to clients, it's expected that you will display appropriate professional standard of behaviour that goes beyond just someone who's acting in a non-professional capacity. This professional conduct should go beyond just your relationship with your clients and extend to your relationship with the TPB, the ATO and other regulatory bodies. Importantly, matters that affect your fitness and propriety may include things like finding of a breach of the code or under a civil penalty provision in relation to the TASA or other relevant legislation. So when a tax practitioner applies for registration with the TPB, we assess their educational qualifications, their work history, and place a strong focus on whether they are fit and proper to be a member of our regulated body. The TASA sets out what the TPB must consider in determining if it is satisfied that an individual is fit and proper for the purposes of registration. This includes, firstly, being of good fame, integrity, and character, uh, having not been convicted of a serious tax offence or an offence involving fraud or dishonesty, having not been penalised for being a promoter of tax exploitation schemes or non-conforming product laws, uh, not having the status of an undischarged bankrupt and not having served a term of imprisonment. Interestingly, in the cases we investigated in the 22-23 year, around about 10% uh, had the fit and proper element to be considered in. Julie, let's do another quick poll to see who must satisfy the fit and proper person requirements. Thanks, Peter. This is another multiple choice question. So once I've launched the poll, you'll um, have a few options to choose from. But the question we're asking this time is who must satisfy the fit and proper person requirement in the TASA? So again, we've got some options to choose from. So first of all, we have individual tax practitioners. Then we have directors of a company tax practitioner. The next option is directors of a company partner or sorry, a partner of a partnership tax practitioner. And we then have individual partners of a partnership tax practitioner. So when you're selecting your response, just assume that all the options provided include those applying to register or are registered as a tax practitioner. And I'll give you a little bit of a hint. There is more than one correct answer for this poll. So I'm just launching that for you now and give you some time to put through your responses and then we'll come back again and share the results with everyone. OK, 
Okay, we've got about 30% so far. Coming through quickly now, I've got about 50%. Okay, I'm just gonna close that poll off now. Thanks to everyone for putting through your responses. I will share those results once again. So again, they'll come up on your screen. Uh, but Peter, we've got 97% of people saying individual tax practitioners uh, must satisfy fit and proper. Uh, 82% are saying directors of a company tax practitioner. 73% believe that it's directors of a company partner, um, sorry, of a partnership. And then we've got 84% saying individual partners of a partnership tax practitioner. So I'll hand back to you now and you can uh, let us know what the correct answer is. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. And again, another really strong result from everybody online. Um, all of the options are correct. Any person who is as an individual, as a director, as a partner, uh, in any of the registered tax practitioner ways must be a fit and proper person. So an individual in their own capacity as a BAS agent or a tax agent, a person who is a director of a company that is a registered company agent, or a person who is a partner in a registered partnership must be a fit and proper person. Also, the directors and individual of these partners must continue to satisfy the fit and proper person test for the whole of the time that they they or those entities remain registered with the TBB. Julie, let's do another poll to see what our practitioners think they should do if an event affecting their registration occurs. Oh, sorry, Peter. I think I'm having a bit of a technical issue with that poll there. We might just skip past that. Sorry, we won't waste okay. everyone's time. But um, if you want to still answer the question, that would be really helpful. So the question is, if you are a registered tax or BAS agent, what should you do if an event affecting your registration occurs? So I'll just hand back to you if you can just give us thank, the answer. Thanks, Julie. When, thank you. When one of those events occurs, um, you must firstly notify the TPB of the event in details in writing within 30 days uh, of the event. Um, you should also disclose the event uh, to the TPB when you're renewing a registration. So the answer really is uh, A and B if renewing registration later than $30, uh, 30 days after the event. Um, the obligations are quite clear. We're going to go through some examples later in, in today's session. So we'll, uh, we'll be doing a bit more work on that. So let's, let's uh, move into reporting fit and proper issues. Um, just to reiterate the requirement, you must notify the TPB in writing if any of the events we've just discussed occurs to you. Uh, you must notify us on, uh, on the day that you became aware or that you should have become aware. Um, there's an online form on our website that you can use to notify us about changes in your circumstances. Uh, and that, you know, that could be an event of personal bankruptcy or it could be uh, an event of lapsing of your uh, PI insurance or something like that. So there's a range of things you can do. Uh, if you happen to be renewing your registration within 30 days of the event, it is sufficient to include the details of that event in your renewal form. However, if the renewal form is not due until later, you must, as I said, notify us within 30 days of the event happening. Uh, so that we've got all the information that we need. Again, when you do come to renewing your registration later, it's again appropriate to make sure that you raise that issue in your renewal application. So just to summarise, you must notify us when changes occur as an individual practitioner, especially if you cease to meet the fit and proper requirement. If you're a partner in a partnership, you must notify if an individual partner or director in that partnership is no longer a fit and proper person. Um, and even that, as, that obligation applies to all of the partners in the partnership. So even if it's not you personally, you need to make sure that your partnership has notified the TPB. Similarly, a company director must notify if themselves or any one of their fellow directors is no longer a fit and proper person. In the case of a company or partnership entity, it will need to ensure that there are appropriate mechanisms and procedures in place as part of your internal governance framework to detect and deal with the conduct and issues 
of partner or director. If you're unsure a particular conduct or event affects fitness and propriety, uh, the individual or partnership entity must still disclose the relevant circumstances and the TPB can help make a decision on whether it is a disclosable event or not. And I will emphasise we don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that if there's a 10 partner partnership, we need 10 separate reports, but there needs to be a system in place to make sure that, that the partnership reports on behalf of all of its partners or similar for a, for a, uh, a company that the company or at least one of its directors reports on behalf of the whole group. So let's jump forward and start talking a little bit about uh, fitness and propriety. Um, as I'm sure you'll understand, there, there isn't a fixed formula or a set standard rule that will determine whether a person is fit and proper to remain registered. What we need to do is consider all of the relevant circumstances in the context of the activities that a person was involved in to make an assessment in relation to their fitness and propriety. We've learned the underlying principles in assessing fitness and propriety is to protect the community and to maintain public confidence in our tax practitioners. It's not set there to penalise or punish misconduct in any particular instance. We believe we can achieve this ultimate objective by protecting, to protect the public by ensuring that only those people who have good fame, integrity and character uh, and have the appropriate skills and knowledge can be registered to continue to be tax practitioners. Some of the relevant factors that help us in determining fitness and propriety include uh, any conduct that indicates or demonstrates a lack of fitness and propriety. How does a tax practitioner manage their own personal tax obligations? It's really important as a practitioner that you have your own personal and related party, uh, related entity tax obligations up to date. It's really important uh, how you conduct your own relationship with the ATO and the TPB. Those relationships should be conducted professionally and, and courteously. Um, any issues of previous poor conduct can be relevant considerations, as is conduct that is not directly related to tax practitioner registration. So some, you know, in particular instances of criminal activity are relevant to determining whether a person is fit and proper. Let's look at some of the conduct that specifically indicates a lack of fitness or propriety. We discussed earlier what we expect from practitioners in terms of professional conduct. We discussed that this requires practitioners have attributes of competence, good fame, integrity and character when dealing with clients and the regular regulators, including the TPB and the ATO. So any conduct that falls short of this standard such that the public, the ATO or the TPB can no longer have confidence that you will perform your role competently and with integrity could indicate that you are no longer fit and proper. Certain offences or conduct are so significant that these types of behaviour will render a person not fit and proper. For example, uh, if you are convicted of tax evasion, if you are convicted of conduct involving fraud, dishonesty, and especially dishonesty or fraud relating to the handling of client money and or the payment of taxes. Um, knowing failure to take appropriate steps to ensure client confidentiality, uh, deliberate failure to take appropriate steps to protect the integrity of the tax system can all be indicators of lack of fitness and propriety. Sometimes individual acts or conduct don't appear so serious when viewed separately. However, it's often the case that when a few small items are viewed together, they constitute a pattern of behaviour that is clearly serious and clearly demonstrates a lack of fitness and propriety. It's very important to highlight that where misconduct has been persistent or has persisted, over several years, it will be more difficult for the person to satisfy the standards of fitness and propriety than for individual short-lived incidents. A person or employer's behaviour towards their own staff or to, a, or to the TPB staff or ATO staff uh, is incredibly important in terms of their own fitness and propriety. Even though a tax practitioner may be extremely competent, any Significant bad behaviour or continued bad behaviour towards their own staff, ATO staff or TPB staff can have an adverse impact on their fitness and propriety as it undermines the required standards 
of the profession. Um, this, this also applies to conduct that is closely connected with the practice of the tax practitioner. We have, uh, in recent times, seen some pretty poor behaviour between agents and uh, TPB staff and ATO staff. And I really would sort of like everybody to think about that, you know, there are people on the other end of the line. And uh, I always, uh, am, you know, blushing from time to time when I hear what some people are saying to, uh, to ATO and TPB staff. Uh, a practitioner who engages in misconduct or wrongdoing may still be considered to be a fit and proper person and there's a range of considerations that we go into. As I've said, where there's, a, where there's habitual poor behaviour, it probably is going to indicate a lack of fitness and propriety. But perhaps where there's an isolated incident and a practitioner is able to demonstrate that they clearly understand that that individual incident or isolated incident was not the right thing to do, uh, demonstrate appropriate con contrition uh, and uh, undertake the right sort of uh, remediatory steps uh, can leave you in a position where despite having one blemish, uh, you may consider to be fit and proper in an ongoing sense. The TPB will clearly consider uh, the tax practitioner's level of frankness and cooperation uh, with us in relation to any response to any queries that our team put to you uh, and just how well you conduct yourself in the cause of, or in the case of an investigation, for instance, uh, can really be to your benefit if you're able to engage professionally and honestly with our team. So just to finish off this section, Julie, have you, have you got another poll for us? I sure do. Yeah, thanks, Peter. So this time um, we just wanted to know what types of behaviour do you think um, could be considered as not being fit and proper when dealing with the TPB? So I'm just going to launch that and that should pop up on your screen. So we've got a few options for you to choose from there. Uh, so we've got um, failure to respond to TPB's requests for information and directions in a timely, responsible and reasonable manner. We have being disrespectful and using abusive language in communicating with the TPB and its officers. Uh, failure to let the TPB know if a staff member who is not a registered tax practitioner or a director or partner is prosecuted for outstanding tax obligations. And then finally, we've got providing false or misleading statements to the TPB and a hint for the this one as well is that there is more than one correct answer. So um, I'll leave it with you for a second to put through your responses. And then once again, once we're finished, I'll share those results with you. Just keep it going for a little bit longer just to give you a chance to put through a response. Okay, I'm just going to close that off, sharing those results on the screen. So it looks like we've got 65% say um, providing false or misleading statements to the TPB, 16% are saying failure to respond to TP P, sorry, TPB requests for information and directions in a timely, responsible and reasonable manner. 13% believe that it's being disrespectful and using abusive language um, in, when communicating with the TPB and its officers. And then 6% are saying failure to let the TPB know if a staff member who is not a registered practitioner or a director or partner is prosecuted from outstanding tax obligations. So Peter, I'll hand to you again and um, get you to tell us what the correct answers are there. Thanks, Julie. The, uh, in this instance, it's A, uh, B, sorry, A, B and D in this, in this example. And, the, you know, really the principles are, and we're going to go, be going through the individual items of the Code of Professional Practice from here, but you do have an obligation to respond to TPB requests for information in a timely and responsible manner. Uh, you have a clear obligation to let... Uh, to behave in a respectful and cooperative fashion when dealing with the TPB and any of its officers, and you're clearly obliged not to make false and misleading statements to a TPB officer in any inquiry or investigation. Um, and so that's the correct answers there. So we'll go on and start talking about the uh, the code of conduct. And the, the Code of Conduct is a, is a principles-based code that sets out the ethical requirements for registered practitioners. 
it's uh, as I've said before, legislated into the into the TASA. The code has seventeen items, and it's grouped under five key principles. The first principle is honesty and integrity. Uh, it includes uh, your personal tax obligations and accounting to clients for their money and property. The second principle is independence, which includes acting in the best interests of clients. The third principle is confidentiality. The fourth principle is competence, including reasonable care. And the fifth principle is other responsibilities, in particular, your responsibilities in relation to the taxation law. So that, you know, you have an obligation to interpret and apply the law uh, in an appropriate fashion. I now want to talk quickly about the civil penalty provisions of, of the Act. There are several civil penalty provisions in the TASA relating to certain conduct of registered tax practitioners and the activities of those who are unregistered practitioners. The civil penalty provisions can be grouped into two categories. They are those things relating to conduct that is prohibited without registration and conduct of registered practitioners. You will be in breach of a civil penalty provision if you knowingly or recklessly, including by omission, uh, make a false or misleading statement to the Commissioner of Taxation, prepare a false or misleading statement which you know or should reasonably know is likely to be made to the Commissioner, or permit an entity or permit or direct an entity to make or prepare a false or misleading statement to the commission. In, in the event of breaching any of these provisions, the TPB can apply to the federal court to have a civil penalty applied to those offences. We'll move on now to talk about the range of sanctions that the TPB has available to you. Have we got the... Uh, I've still got the uh, poll on my screen, Julie, so I don't know whether that needs to be closed. How's that, Peter? Has that taken it off? I've just, shut, I've just shut it with my own cursor. I don't know what was going on there. Okay, we're up to speed on the on the sanctions slide. Fantastic. So when, when we find that a practitioner has failed to comply with the TASA, the TPB has a range of of sanctions, the administrative sanctions that are available to us uh, to apply. These range from a simple written caution, which really is uh, to say to a, a practitioner, look, we can see that you've done the wrong thing. Um, please make sure that you correct your behaviour and there's there's little more to it than that. There's also a range of, of more active sanctions that we can apply, including uh, the uh, suspension of a practitioner's registration or the making of a specific order, uh, or in fact, for the most egregious cases, a termination of their um, of their registration. So the orders often revolve around things like making sure you've got your personal tax obligations up to date, which includes all of your own lodgements, the lodgements for your related entities, that you've paid your tax, or if you're in a position where you can't actually manage to pay your tax, at least you've entered into and are maintaining an appropriate payment arrangement that's approved by the ATO so that you're in compliance with their requirements. Um, or it might be an order in relation to doing some specific additional CPE, maybe some training in ethics or, or some technical training, or in some occasions where people are a bit unaware of the requirements of the TASA, we ask them to do a, a course in the TASA to get up to speed in, on what's going on in the regulatory environment. In, in the really more difficult cases or perhaps cases where we've been unable to resolve them with a uh, with an order uh, sometimes we'll suspend a practitioner's registration until they've complied with their orders uh, and in the really bad cases uh, there'll be a termination of their registration when uh, when a practitioner is terminated the the board has the ability to uh, issue an order that prevents that person from reapplying for registration for a period up to five years. The maximum five year period is reserved for the worst of cases, but I will say that, you know, really significant care and attention is, much, is given to any case that could lead to termination. The severity of a sanction depends very much on the nature and extent of the breaches and the individual circumstances of each case. Whenever a, 
a decision is made and a sanction is imposed, the practitioners have a right of review with the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. The AAT provides an independent review and may publish its decision. The board also has the capacity to apply to the federal court uh, to impose uh, civil penalties, uh, which can uh, apply uh, a penalty for up to $55,000 per breach. And for a body corporate, the maximum, pen maximum penalty is $277,000 per breach. Now that we've outlined those um, sanction issues, I think it'd be good to just work through a little case study, a couple of case studies on what uh, what's going on. So our first case study highlights the importance of reporting an event that may affect your registration. So in this instance, after an investigation, uh, the TPB terminated the registration of a tax agent as an individual on the basis that an event affecting their registration as outlined in the TASA had occurred in the previous five years. As I mentioned before, there are certain events that may affect your registration, including uh, when you've been sentenced to a term of imprisonment. In this case, it was found that the agent had been convicted of an offence resulting in a sentence of imprisonment and that they had failed to notify this to us within the 30 days as required under the law. Due to the seriousness of the breach and the agent's serious failure of judgment by not reporting their criminal conviction, we imposed a six-month ban on being able to reapply for registration. This outcome really serves as a reminder against failing to report any relevant event. Moving on to case study two, um, involves an agent who knowingly obstructed the proper administration of the tax laws on multiple occasions. They continuously failed to comply with their own tax obligations, not only in their individual capacity, but also as the director and trustee of a number of entities. Our investigation found that the agent had breached four items of the code. Specifically, they failed to act with honesty and integrity. Uh, they failed to comply with the tax laws in the conduct of their own personal affairs. They didn't ensure that the tax agent services that they provided were provided competently, uh, and they didn't or they, they did knowingly obstruct the proper administration of the tax laws. The agent in their individual capacity and as the sole director of two entities lodged multiple income tax returns and BAS statements containing overstated deductions and or credits and or undeclared income, which the ATO audited and determined they were not entitled to. This gave rise to significant tax shortfalls and penalties being imposed. The tax agent also failed to pay multiple debts by their due dates, and these tax obligations amounted to over $1.6 million. The agent, in their capacity as a director, failed to cause two companies to comply with their superannuation obligations and failed to cause multiple entities to lodge numerous statements to the ATO by their respective due dates. I will emphasise that the board takes super guarantee matters and pay as you go tax instalment matters very seriously because that really is other people's money. In addition to as a sole director of the registered tax agent company, the agent was found to have caused the company to engage in conduct that breached multiple items of the code. Specifically, this conduct included preparing and lodging in income tax returns for client, which contained deductions that the ATO found the client could provide no substantiation for and therefore had no entitlement to. The ATO also cancelled another company's GST registration after it found that the company was not carrying on a business. <clears throat> another company client had GST credits disallowed for 14 quarterly BAS statements that were prepared and lodged by the tax agent company. After the ATO had found that the client did not hold any tax invoices for the reported purchases at the time of lodgement, and could otherwise not substantiate any of the amounts. We found that the agent had ceased to meet the registration requirements, that they were fit and proper person based on this persistent disregard for their obligations under the code and the determination that they were not fit, a fit and proper person, the commissioner, clients and all the public could have confidence in to perform the functions of a registered tax agent honestly and with integrity. The tax agent's registration was terminated and a five-year ban from reapplication for registration was imposed. Mm -hmm. 
I'd now like to uh, move forward and talk about some of the the recent changes to the relevant law governing tax practitioners in the TPP. As I discussed at the beginning of the webinar, recent events have highlighted areas for improvement in the current regulatory framework for tax practitioners and the broader system in which they operate. So in August 2023, the government announced a significant package of reforms to crack down on misconduct and to rebuild confidence in the system and structures that keep our tax system and capital markets strong. These reforms are intended to strengthen the integrity of the tax system, increase the powers of the regulators, specifically the TPB, and strengthen the regulatory framework to ensure that they are fit for purpose. Treasury Laws Amendment Bill Number One, <clears throat> sorry, Treasury Laws Amendment Bill 2023 Measures Number One, uh, and the introduction of Treasury Laws Amendment Tax Accountability and Fairness Bill 2023 mark an important milestone for the TPB. This is the first legislative step in implementing the first tranche of recommendations from the James Review, which was a 2019 independent review into the effectiveness of the TPB and the TASA, and to ensure that TPB's legislative framework remains fit for purpose. The important uh, changes are summarised on this slide, but specifically, uh, there's an expansion to the code to prevent engagement of disqualified entities, which is effective from 1 January 24. Uh, the, the minister now has the ability to make a ministerial instrument to expand the code. Uh, we are moving to an annual registration instead of a three-year registration period, effective 1 July 2024. <clears throat> we have mandatory breach self-reporting, effective from 1 July 2024. We have mandatory breach reporting of other tax practitioners from 1 July 2024. Uh, we have up, updating of the objects clause of the legislation, which will, is effective from 1 January 24. Uh, enhanced uh, independence for the TPB through a special account from 1 July 2024. Uh, and we have community representative standards being implemented for board members uh, appointed to the TPB with effect from 1 October 2024. These changes that have either started or will be rolled out through, through the year include expanding the code to prevent practitioners from using or employing a disqualified entity without the approval of the TPB. So a disqualified entity is effectively a practitioner who has been terminated from being a registered practitioner by the TPB. In the event that you want to employ or use the services of such a person, you require the express written permission of the TPB to do so, and there is an application form on our website uh, if you need to do that. <clears throat> These changes uh, really will enhance the TPB's effectiveness and independence and assist us to raise community confidence in the system. I'd now like to move on and talk about the, uh, the proposed reforms. Just before I do that, um, I just want to talk about the self-reporting and um, and compulsory reporting of other practitioners. As, as you'll be aware, these uh, these provisions are coming into effect with uh, an operative date, 1 July 2024. Um, before then, the TPB will provide significant written guidance in how those requirements are to be interpreted, and specifically we will give you as much guidance as we can on the practical uh, implementation of what is and what is not a significant event. And the reporting obligations do revolve around significant events affecting the registration. So there will be um, more webinars uh, and there will be written guidance on our website to talk about those matters. Um, moving on to the proposed reforms, uh, the second stage of the government's responses include measures that strengthen the integrity of the tax system and increase the powers of the relevant regulators. This, these proposals will increase the scope and penalty amount of penalty provisions that apply to promoters of taxation exploitation schemes. They'll improve the information exchange between government agencies, for instance, the ATO, the TPB, ASIC, et cetera, to make sure that those bodies are able to appropriately share information. Uh, they'll extend whistleblower protection for those who wish to disclose alleged misconduct to the TPB. So 
disclosures by practitioners and complaints by practitioners will be able to be protected by whistleblower legislation and enable enhanced TBB investigations and improve transparency of tax practitioner misconduct on the TBB register. So we'll have an increased ability uh, to publish on our register uh, our sanctions and decisions uh, that have been made. Moving on to the next slide, we're talking about the, the next phase of government consultation. Uh, the response that focuses on the proposals will be the subject of detailed consultation between Treasury, the TPB, the professional associations and community representations to make sure that the law is as practical and easily implemented as possible. In the next couple of slides, I'll discuss some of the new sanctions and code obligations that we can expect to see from future reforms. Late last year, Treasury released a consultation paper to strengthen the TPB sanctions regime. In particular, we're looking to in, have available a robust regime with graduated sanctions that will have a greater deterrence effect on those that engage in misconduct and will allow the TPB to respond to misconduct in a timely manner with sanctions that are proportionate to the severity of the contravention of the law. I really would point out that, that these increased sanctions won't be a great problem for the, you know, the vast majority of you who do the right thing. You, you won't see this, but these sanctions will be a great assistance to the TPB in ironing out the sort of really bad behaviour that gives the whole of the profession a bad name. In particular, the consultation process proposes a number of new sanctions, including criminal penalties for unregistered tax practitioners. And I know that many of you have trouble with competing or getting a level playing field competition against unregistered practitioners. There'll be a broader and increased civil penalties available under the TASA. Uh, there'll be an infringement notice scheme attached to the civil penalty regime. Also, a new TPB power to allow us to have uh, an enforceable voluntary undertaking with tax practitioners. So that there's an agreement uh, on how to behave going forward that will be enforceable. Uh, and also a new TPB power to impose interim and contingent sanctions in, in really bad cases. And one of the things that I will emphasise here, we, we've seen a number of instances recently where agents have been engaged in obvious criminal conduct, uh, defrauding their clients, um, waste, you, you know, using client refund money for gambling and drug habits. And we really need that ability to step in and stop those people from practising to protect the public and their clients from any any further abuse by these sort of bad behaviour. It's hard to imagine an interim sanction or contingent suspension being applied in anything but the most egregious of cases. Um, I want to move on now to talk about some of the new proposed code obligations. Um, obviously, late last year, Treasury released the draft determination that it contains proposed additional obligations that will supplement supplement the obligations already in the code. The new proposed obligations include criminal penalties for unregistered practitioners, uh, upholding and promoting the ethical standards of the tax provision, um, obligations in relation to false or misleading statements to the TPB and the ATO, specific provisions in relation to conflict of interest management when dealing with government, uh, more specific obligations in relation to maintaining confidentiality in dealings with government, very specific obligations in relation to keeping of proper client records, ensuring tax agent services provided on your behalf are provided competently. So that's about adequate supervision and control, uh, quality assurance and other internal controls and proper communication, keeping your clients informed of all relative, relevant matters in relation to your own behaviour as a tax practitioner. So there will be obligations on practitioners to inform their clients if there are matters affecting their own registration. These proposals are designed to ensure that the code and the obligations remain fit for purpose and are contemporary and responsive to emerging risks around ethics and integrity. There's also a future reform program and Treasury will be working uh, with, with us, the ATO and the profession to work on the 
the appropriate framework going forward. This will include reviewing the current tax practitioner registration requirements, continuing to review the penalty regime that applies to promoters of tax schemes and penalties applicable to practitioners who make false and leading this false and misleading statements in the community. So the, the ATO and TPB respective investigation and gathering information gathering powers. So for instance, uh, our investigation period will be able to be extended up to a maximum of two years to enable us to do a really effective job of those really high end bad behavior scenarios. Uh, and there'll also be ongoing review of the secrecy provisions that restrict information sharing between government bodies such as the ATO and the TPB. There'll be a new focus on the use of legal professional privilege in Commonwealth investigations and the regulation of consulting and accounting and audit firms at large is under renewed focus. I'd like to now talk about working collectively and collaboratively uh, within the profession. Um, and as I stated at the outset, we, we do know and we see every day that the vast majority of tax practitioners do the right thing. There is a small minority that don't and they take advantage of their privileged position within the regulated population. There are aspects of the current regulatory framework that need to be enhanced so that there are appropriate responses when misconduct occurs. We welcome the government reforms which will enhance our regulatory framework but even with these reforms, enhancing ethic, ethical and professional standards in the profession is a role that needs to be shared between the TPB, the professional bodies and practitioners at large. So we very much value your assistance in this, in this collective effort. Um, we will be working closely, as I said, with, the, with government, with other regulators, with educators and with professional bodies, as well as all of you in the profession. In concluding today, some of the key considerations that I'd like to give you as takeaways. Uh, on an individual basis, if we can all aim to be uh, a role model for other practitioners, uh, whether it be uh, your colleagues or whether it be your own staff, I think if we can all role model the right behaviour, it, it's infectious. Please be aware of your own obligations and values and embody them in your day-to-day -day work, not only because you have to do so, but because it's the right thing to do. We ask you always to put your client's interests before your own because that's the right thing to do. Uh, we very much encourage you to take advantage of all of the CPE opportunities available to make sure that you keep up to date technically and technologically as it's an essential part of your career as a tax practitioner. And we specifically note again that cyber training uh, is, is eligible for CPE credits with the TPB. We'd like to encourage everybody to take due care and consideration in understanding the needs and issues of your clients to make sure that the advice and services you provide are provided uh, in their best interests. And we also think that uh, just making rational, considered and well thought out decisions that will stand the test of future scrutiny and, uh, and seek objective and independent views and assistance of your colleagues if you're unsure. That brings today's session uh, to an end. But Julie, I'm sure there'll be some questions from the audience that have come through. So happy to hand back to you and uh, and address any questions that have come through. You. Thank you so much, Peter. We've had a lot of questions come through, so I will ask you a few. Uh, the first one I've got for you is um, an anonymous attendee has asked, if a tax agent does declare a conviction of criminal offence within 30 days to the TPB, will the circumstances be reviewed or is that an automatic termination for the tax agent? Uh, Julie, every, every one of those declarations will be given proper consideration. Um, a, a criminal conviction that leads to a sentence of imprisonment is highly likely to lead to a termination, but it's not automatic and, and we will give proper consideration to whether it should lead to a termination before we make a decision. Great, thank you for that. Um, the next question I've got is a philosophical question from Amanda and she's asking, who are we agents for? Uh, for example, are we agents for our clients or agents of the ATO? The your agency is clearly an agency for your client. You're appointed as the agent for your client in your dealings with the ATO. That said, it, it's clear from the, the TASA 
that you have an obligation to uh, interpret the law appropriately. So acting in the best interest of your client doesn't mean misinterpreting the law or taking advantage of inappropriate structuring or inappropriate uh, deduction claims or anything like that. So you have an obligation to understand and interpret and apply the law competently and professionally, but your agency is clearly on behalf of your client. That's good to know. Thank you for sharing that, Peter. Um, the next question I've got is, um, I've got another anonymous one here, is do you have an obligation to report a suspected scheme or Phoenix activity if you have knowledge about it? Um, and how does the commissioner act on it? If that, uh, if your knowledge is relating to a registered tax practitioner, yes, and, and it is a significant breach, Yes, you are obliged to report it. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I've got. I'd oh, have sorry, to do you have more? I think, you know, fraud and phoenixing are significant. Thank you. Um, okay, I've got Vivian asking: Will it be a breach of any code of conduct items if a tax agent prepares and lodges its own entity's tax returns? So, for example, um, an accounting firm where the registered tax practitioner is the director. Uh, that, that's fine. You're, you're entitled to prepare and lodge your own returns. Um, your obligations in relation to the, you know, the tax law and competent interpretation of the law remain the same, whether it's your own or for a client. Great. Thank you. Um, I've got a question about the new annual registration process, Peter, as well. Um, I've got someone asking what the fee structure will be for the annual registration. So the, the final determination of the fee structure is a matter for the government and they haven't advised us as yet. The thing I can say is that the recommendation from the James Review was that the current fee would be divided by three and charged annually. And at this stage, we expect that the, the fee will be determined in that way uh, and there will obviously be you know, inflation adjusted. Um, but that final determination is yet to be made by the government. Thanks, Peter. And we'll keep everyone updated as soon as we've got more information on that. So just um, keep an eye on e-news and um, things like that, social media. We'll update you there. Um, so the next question I've got, Peter, is uh, what safeguards will be in place to protect whistleblowers who report another tax practitioner? And when will reporting extend beyond just compliance? And when will it become defamation? The, the So... Reporting pursuant to the Whistleblower Protections will have the full protection of the Whistleblower Act. Uh, and when that comes into play, it will be uh, clearly a very safe and well-managed process for the person who is doing the whistleblowing. The rest of the question, I'd, I'd say, Julie, is a, that's going to come down to very specific facts. So sure. I think I'd have to, to you know, politely decline to try and answer that today. No problem. That's fine. Thank you for that, Peter. I've had a couple of people asking today about um, certificates for attendance. We will send you those. So if you've stayed online for the session today, you'll receive one via the um, email that you've used to register for today. So we'll send those out following the session. Um, so the next question I've got for you, Peter, is um, it's around people that have actually offended. Um, this question is why are they allowed to practice after offending? Surely they will go ahead and do the same thing. When we have a, a board conduct committee case, we, we go through the quite a detailed process to make the decisions about what sanctions are appropriate. And in, in every case, the practitioner who's been investigated has a right of reply. So we get a submission on their behaviour and we also get a reply from the practitioner in relation to the circumstances and surrounding circumstances. We assess the overall position for some of the people that are sanctioned, we've seen that they've made some mistakes in the past or they've done something wrong in the past. Uh, we can see through how they've conducted their interaction with us that they're genuinely uh, contrite for their behaviour, that they now recognise that that's not the right way to behave and they've demonstrated a willingness to take that on the chin, to cop whatever sanction that they've been given and, and to be able to go forward in the right manner. So in those sort of circumstances, we'll impose a sanction that won't prevent them from continuing to practice. In the more egregious, you know, recidivist behaviour, repeated bad behaviour, 
uh, lack of contrition, or just simple, you know, dishonesty like, you know, defrauding clients involved in fraud against the tax system, those sort of things, there's just no question that they shouldn't be in the system. So they're the ones that are terminated. Thanks, Peter. I think that's all we've got time for in terms of questions, but I just wanted to say thanks to everyone for putting through your questions. There's been some really good ones coming through today. And um, what we will do is we will share some of the questions and answers on our website in the next coming week or so. Uh, so yeah, please, um, if your question hasn't been answered today, we will get to you and we will publish them on the website as well, just so that everyone can benefit from the answers as well. Um, so just uh, to finalise today's webinar, I just wanted to say a big thank you to Peter for sharing um, all those useful insights with us today. It was good to hear about the reform program and um, some of the ethical uh, changes that are coming up. And um, I also wanted to say thank you to Madeline and to Kristen for assisting with the questions. They've been very busy there helping everyone out. Um, we do hope that you have found the webinar beneficial and as I said at the beginning um, it does count towards your CPE and we will issue an attendance certificate to those of you who stayed online today. Um, just some information on keeping up to date, um, jump on our website tpb.gov.au. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter, that's where you'll get the most up-to-date uh, information and as I also said we've got our TPB e-news uh, that goes out monthly. If you haven't subscribed to that I'd highly recommend that you do. Uh, there's lots of changes coming up and this is a great way to keep informed. So just again, go to our website, tpb.gov.au forward slash newsroom and you can subscribe there. Um, another great tool is our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that as well to receive notifications when we post new videos and we do record all of our webinars. So if you aren't able to attend, you can watch them and you can still actually count um, that towards your CPE as well for viewing the recordings. Um, so just finally, before we finish up, we'll be launching an exit survey and we would really appreciate it if you could complete it super quick only takes a moment of your time but your feedback's really valuable it helps us improve on the webinars and you can also suggest topics that you might be interested in hearing about from us and we do review those and try to um, incorporate those into our program as well so the survey will just pop up in your browser once you leave the webinar today and once again just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and we'll talk to you again soon thanks everyone thanks peter Thanks, Julie. Talk Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye.